director is not only working with students and doing the things we tend to do, uh, but it's being part of things like this, uh, even though it's uh, from the sidelines, and uh, partnering with uh, notable institutions like the Berkman Center, and I want to recognize them, and, and King Darling in particular for being part of this. Thank you, Kate. So again, good morning. I'm so happy to see all of you here today. Um, I, I want to uh, thank Craig not only for the introduction, but for all the work that he has done here with the center to make this event and other events like it uh, possible. Again, uh, thanks to the Berkman Center for co-sponsoring this event with us and Kate for uh, doing a lot, a lot of work uh, to, to uh, get things organized. Free pens. Um, you, you don't get much better than free pens. Um, <laughs> so uh, mostly, though, I want to thank all of you uh, for being here uh, this morning. I don't want to take up too much time uh, with any kind of introductory or remarks, in part because I want to leave a little bit of a, a buffer in our schedule uh, so that we can all get out of here on time. I know that's important to everyone. Um, but also uh, because I'm really excited uh, to hear from this incredible group of people that we've managed to assemble today and to give all of you an opportunity uh, to kind of engage with, uh, with us with your own thoughts uh, and questions. What I do want to do is provide uh, a kind of overview of just the organizing themes uh, of today's event uh, and give you a little bit of an indication about what the structure is going to be, how the day is going to proceed and to correct at least one error uh, in the agenda that Kate helpfully uh, pointed, uh, pointed out to me. Um, well, well, you told me, Mike told you. So um, we, will, we, will, <laughs> we, will, uh, we will get to, to that correction uh, in a minute. But in terms of organizing themes, uh, maybe we can start there, right? So intellectual property law tells us uh, a story about creative production, right? And that story goes something like this. Uh, we live in a world where ideas and expression require significant investments of time and of resources. And you know, rational creators are only going to make those investments if they have some reliable prospect of a reasonable return on those investments, right? Um, but of course, if competitors can come along and copy all their stuff, they're not going to see those returns. And and all of our poets and inventors are instead going to uh, opt out of creativity and become accountants and, and plumbers or something with like a reliable stream of income, right? Um, so we create intellectual property law as, uh, you know, as a means of creating barriers to that kind of copying to give these people a fighting chance at some kind of economic return. That's the story that we tell, right? Um, that's the story that animates most of IP law in the US, and, and sometimes uh, that story is actually true, right? Um, I do not deny that sometimes that story is true. Oftentimes, maybe that story uh, is true. But there are other ways aside from legal uh, intervention to deal with the threats and the reality of copying, right? 
And today we're here to think about and talk about those alternatives, right? How can creators who can't avail themselves of the legal system or choose not to avail themselves of the legal system, how can they maintain the, the incentives necessary for creativity, right? We're gonna talk about two basic strategies, two basic answers uh, to that question today. One is self-regulation through social norms. Uh, and the other broadly kind of depends on finding some sort of marketplace uh, solution to avoid or at least minimize the impact of copy, right? Um, so those are the kinds of stories that we're focused on today. And part of the impetus uh, for uh, this event is a book that Kate and I have been working on for a while and that many of our speakers today are uh, uh, are generously uh, contributing to. Um, in terms of structure, here's how the day is gonna get divided up. Uh, the morning session is gonna have four sets of talks, four pairs of talks that focus on particular uh, creative communities. So we're gonna get um, some accounts of the way those communities operate, what drives their creativity, how they respond to copying, um, and kind of what explains those choices, right? So we're gonna see eight different communities sort of uh, in action. Um, we've paired presenters together who we think are going to complement uh, each other. Uh, they will each have 15 minutes uh, to sort of uh, explain uh, these communities to us and then what we hope is they're gonna have an opportunity to engage with each other, to talk to each other, ask each other questions and reflect uh, on the contrast and the similarities in each of those uh, areas. And then we'll turn things over to all of you for questions. Um, that's the morning, that takes us up to lunch at 12.30. Uh, uh, after lunch, uh, we've got an afternoon divided into two uh, larger and longer uh, panels that'll give us a chance to kind of step back uh, and think about how these various projects fit together. Are there some common unifying themes that we can identify, uh, explanations that help make sense of all of these disparate communities and their behavior? And what do they tell us, if anything, about efforts to reform our IP law? What are the limits on the kinds of insights uh, that this line of research can provide? Um, the one correction to the agenda that all of you have is that uh, Mike Madison appears twice. We are not going to make him speak twice. Um, the, second, the second time you see Mike's name, uh, you should substitute Chris Sprigman's name. Um, that's, uh, that's, the, uh, that's the one correction. Just on the screen balance, though, I'll try. I think it's correct online. Yeah, I think that's right. We will sort this out and have a definitive <laughs> announcement at lunch. Um, but I think what I just said is correct. Um, for our speakers, um, just so you know, Kate and I will be uh, keeping time. Um, so be, be on the lookout uh, for that. Um, anything else that we need to add? Uh, I have a question. Are we being webcast? We are. Okay. Hello, so Internet. We're being webcast, just FYI. So we have microphones down here. We have two microphones. Please come up. You can take them out of the stand. Um, if you have questions during the day, um, that will make you be heard online. So there's that. And then, nope, that's it. That's all. Excellent. So uh, we succeeded in getting a little bit of buffer in our schedule. So what I want to do now is bring uh, our, our first two speakers up. Uh, we have Chris Bacafusco from uh, Chicago Kent Law School. Uh, and uh, we have uh, Matt Shears. Uh, Matt, you're an adjunct at? Georgetown. Georgetown? Okay. 
Uh, so uh, let's, let's welcome them up and they're gonna talk to us about food and drink. Fired up, we're ready to go. Okay, good, so uh, thank you all for coming this morning. Uh, very excited to, uh, to get to kick things off and uh, incredibly grateful to, uh, to Aaron and Kate for organizing a very exciting conference with a lot of fun and cool and smart people. Uh, I think this is gonna be a really interesting day and uh, really happy to be here. Uh, I wanna talk about uh, kind of culinary creativity. Right, so, so the field that, we're, uh, that, that Matt and I uh, are assigned to discuss today is work that he and I have been doing, thinking about the ways in which people who are uh, producing food and beverage type stuff uh, are doing so creatively despite relatively limited or uh, perhaps no formal intellectual property protection. So we've learned a lot about the abilities of creators to innovate even in the absence of formal IP protection, right? In the culinary industry, this is certainly true, right? You don't need to, to spend too much time looking at the productions of elite restaurant chefs to know that despite the fact that they don't really get copyrights or patents or trademarks usually or trade secrets or all of these intellectual property things not terribly helpful for the kinds of work that they're doing nonetheless we see lots and lots and lots of creativity right and i decided not to give you guys pictures of food to keep you from getting hungrier this morning right but you can imagine the kinds of things we might see if i were showing you pictures of pretty food up here right and the kinds of things that get created on a regular basis at the elite restaurants around the country and around the world right and this is gives us some reason to, 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 to be cautious about the standard economic statement uh, about the role of incentives and IP in, in the culinary industry, right? the kind of stuff that uh, Aaron was alluding to earlier. Today I wanna make, I think, I'm gonna try to make two separate contributions uh, to this literature. Right? So the first thing I wanna do is I wanna think not necessarily about uh, elite restaurant chefs, about whom we know a fair amount at this point, but rather about the role of uh, uh, intellectual property or informal norms or something in uh, culinary publishing uh, and cookbooks and in uh, magazines to maybe compare and contrast those relationships to see if there's something more that we can learn about what's going on in these negative spaces. And second, I wanna talk a bit about social norms more broadly and connect up uh, this discussion of social norms with some issues in moral psychology uh, and their relationships to intellectual properties, overarching kind of consequentialist uh, creativity optimizing goals. Right, so, so first on to chefs and cooking. Right, so we've seen that chefs are really good at being creative, at coming up with all kinds of new dishes. Right, choose your favorite. Right, mine is oysters and pearls. Right, but choose your favorite thing. Right, they're coming up with these things despite the fact that they have little or no formal intellectual property protection. Right, so what accounts for this? Uh, the literature suggests that much like in other fields, about which we'll hear plenty today, there are a number of factors to seem to be at work. Right, so so chefs constitute uh, a relatively small, coherent, cohesive, homogeneous group of people, which includes not just chefs, but restaurateurs, uh, critics, other kinds of people who are capable of, of parsing, uh, like who's doing what creatively, who's, who's cheating, who's pirating dishes, right? Where's the value and from whom? There seem to be a strong set of convergent social norms about appropriate behavior, whom you're allowed to copy, whom you're not allowed to copy, if you have to give attribution, uh, all of these kinds of things. There's an open sharing culture that seems to work really well for chefs. Uh, there's also an ability to make money, not through necessarily the creativity of the, 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 the recipe itself, right? but through, through additional sorts of things like performance, Right? It's not necessarily just the value of the intellectual property, the, the, the dish itself. It's the opportunity to set that dish in a broader performative experience of going to the restaurant. Right, The, 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 the recipe is not, is not a perfect substitute 
whether cooked at Thomas Keller's restaurant or in my kitchen, right? So, so this, is, this, is, this is the point here. Copying by users doesn't matter very much and in fact may be a good thing, right? So when chefs are publishing their recipes, putting their recipes out into the world, other people are knocking them off. Copying by the rest of us low lives, right? You know, doesn't necessarily harm their bottom line and in fact perhaps makes us more excited to eat at these restaurants, to go to these places. And finally, and this is important, I think the internet is a tool for policing creativity and copying rather than for making it right rather than for expanding copying right so in the stand in the kind of what are now I guess for those of you who read this kind of stuff canonical discussions about uh, culinary creativity right usually what happens is some chef from somewhere goes and, and works at some restaurant in New York or Chicago or LA goes back to his hometown cooks those dishes dishes there, right, the exact same ones, doesn't provide attribution, and someone takes some photos of them and says, look, these look just like the things at French Laundry or WD-50 or Alinea, right? And then the internet then becomes this tool not for disseminating copies, but rather for catching the pirates, right? Uh, and so this is, this is I think, important. Um, but how do these factors affect the culinary publishing industry? To what extent is culinary publishing, the production of creative dishes, not in elite restaurant kitchens, but in food magazines and in cookbooks and other things like that, uh, to what extent does that mirror what we're seeing in the restaurant industry itself? Here we see lots and lots and lots and lots of copying. Right? It's not very difficult to go on the internet and find all of the recipes from any cookbook or chef or anything that you want for free, easily downloadable, easily copyable, easily disseminated. But we also see lots and lots and lots of production as well. So although the publishing industry itself has been shrinking over the past decade or so, production and sales of cookbooks has been expanding dramatically. Right? So has production of food-related magazines, right? Like I didn't pull the numbers on this, right? I need to like make Paul Heald run one of those studies where he like pulls like cookbooks by year, you know, on Amazon. Right? And you'll know what the graph looks like, right? The graph is going way up over the 2000s, right? There were like nine cookbooks in the 70s, right? And now there are like 100,000 cookbooks a week, right? Like you know what the graph is going to look like. That's what it's going to look like, right? Um, and this is in some ways especially surprising because cookbooks at least are fairly durable goods and in some ways more durable than a lot of the other kinds of things that we might be thinking about in intellectual property, right? Uh, the nth cookbook is subject to diminishing marginal returns in a way that like the nth album isn't necessarily uh, or the nth piece of software or movie, right? Like, you know, once you've got Paula Wolfert's The Cooking of Southwest France, my favorite cookbook, right? You don't necessarily need the next cookbook that's kind of also about the cooking of Southwest France, right? And even if you've got, you know, Thomas Keller's first book, you don't necessarily also need, you know, David Chang's book or maybe, right? But like, you know, these things are subject to maybe some, you know, so, some, you know, less to, to concerns about diminishing marginal value. Are they more about it rather than less? Right? So then let's look back at the factors that seem to matter for culinary creativity at the elite restaurant chefs and see how they apply here. Well, the groups are much more heterogeneous here. They're less tightly knit, right? I don't really know much about the norms here. I think this is an open area for study. People are looking for PhD theses, right? I think it would be fun to think about what's going on. Like there is certainly some litigation or threat of litigation along these kinds of things. Certainly some kinds of chefs are actively policing or some kinds of publications are actively policing their copyrights on the internet. Right, so if you try to post, right, so like Jamie Oliver is, is pretty IP aggressive on the internet, right? If you post, here's Jamie's dish for mushy peas, right? Then, you know, someone from jamieoliver.com will like, you know, yell at you and send you takedown notices and things like that. And I think, you know, Rachel Ray is as well. So some people are much more aggressive about this stuff than others. Um, it is more difficult to substitute performance for the kinds of creativity that are published in magazines. The kinds of people who are publishing this are different, right? Sometimes these books are by restaurant chefs, right? And they want you to just go to the restaurant. Sometimes though they're not, right? These are by people who are professional cookbook publishers, right? Paula Wolford doesn't have a restaurant, right? Her goal is to sell cookbooks. All she does is sell cookbooks, right? Uh, and so it might be much more difficult for her to substitute out the, the recipes for some other kind of thing she could be selling. Here, copying by users, especially when being posted on the internet, could be substantially undermining the value of these works. Uh, and again, now the internet, rather than being a tool for detection, becomes a tool for copying. 
Right? So many of these things, in fact, point exactly in the opposite directions that they pointed for elite restaurant chefs. Uh, so what could still be going on here to suggest that we're seeing a lot of creativity? I, you know, I don't really have a lot of really terrific solutions here, right? One possibility is just this is a brief cultural moment where foodieism is expanding at an crazy rate and the demand for cookbooks is just completely outstripping everything else and like people just want more and more and more stuff as fast as people can buy it uh, and produce it um, so that's a possibility right there's also always this problem about you know more publishing and production not necessarily leading to more creativity right we always have a difficult question in these areas of trying to figure out what do we mean by more creativity do we see that here or not? Uh, these are hard questions to answer and ones I don't necessarily have a lot of thoughts on. I'd rather kind of set this up for, for later discussion. Finally, at the end, I want to turn and think about more broadly about these questions of norms. There's going to be a lot of talk about social norms today. I think a lot of us were attracted to this field in part because we're attracted to the role that social norms play in um, of giving us creative production without the expense of intellectual property law, right? So, so many of us are probably skeptical of the claims of the copyright lobbies that, you know, they need all of these broad and long protections in order to be able to support what they do. We like to be able to point to these little groups who are doing all of this really terrific creativity in the absence of strong IP. And we say, look, norms here are doing a lot of this work really well. And I like that. And I agree. And I think it's often really terrific, right, in the way that law, that norms can solve problems that law seems to not be doing so well. What I do want to do, though, is create at least a kind of limited defense of some copyright law against some kinds of social norms, which is to say we need to view social norms through the lens of moral psychology, right? And so this is something that Dave and I are working on that, you know, many, some of you may have seen or heard us talk about it at some point in the past, coming to a, you know, SSRN feed near you sometime soon, right? Um, the norms that we get in these cases are the product of moral psychologies of the groups that produce them, right? Sometimes these norms, the norms that get produced within any given creative group then, uh, run counter to the goals of intellectual property law, right? Intellectual property law's goal is optimizing creative production, right? Balancing incentives and access by, in an attempt to optimize creative production. And the law has a set of principles for doing this. Norms may do that very well, right? So for example, we see this going very well with respect to sharing, right? So the culinary industry is a great example of this, right? Norms about sharing seem to be doing an enormously valuable job of promoting creativity <coughs> within the culinary industry. You come and share for me, then next time I'll come and share something with you, right? We'll go back and forth and we'll build together and this will be great and we will be loving and familial rather than competitive. But keep in mind, right? Sharing always has problems itself, right? Sharing is always a question of sharing with whom, right? And there's going to be a lot more sharing within the group than outside the group, right? And so I think we need to be careful to make sure that we're, we're anxious, that, that, that we notice that these norms might play differently within groups and without groups, that this might affect power relations, this might affect who gets access to intellectual property or the creativity that gets produced, right? So even with something as good as sharing, I think that there's a, a, a worrisome story to be told. And I think there are worrisome stories to be told about a number of other aspects of the way that social norms work in a variety of these fields. So when you talk to chefs, right? Chefs like to think an awful lot about the kinds of things that they might have property-like interests in. They don't make strong distinctions between ideas and expression, right? Intellectual property law thinks that this is a very important distinction for purposes of preserving the public domain, right? Chefs don't necessarily think in these ways, right? Chefs think, you know, that was my idea to combine, you know, shrimp paste and, you know, whatever, right, in this way, and like, then I get that. Right, you know, that's what's, and this is a, and the same, right, same with labor versus originality. This is something that copyright law stresses very deeply, right? The only thing you get create intellectual property rights in are the things that have some kind of originality and creativity. You don't get intellectual property rights merely for labor in US copyright law, right? Whereas labor as a matter of moral psychology plays an incredibly strong normative role. Right? People value labor deeply, and we might see claims based on labor that would not be claims that would be accepted otherwise. Attribution, 
And so now the case, right, norms are always in favor of attribution, right? In almost everybody's talks today, right, there's gonna be a lot of discussion of attribution. Attribution's really nice sometimes, but attribution has costs as well. And intellectual property law, at least in the United States, or copyright law in the United States, kind of worried about attribution for various reasons, right? We should too be concerned about a lot of these kinds of things. Right, so in each of these cases, the norms that arise may differ from the doctrines that intellectual property law itself has adopted. What may seem good for individuals or what may seem good for in-groups may not necessarily be good for culture and creativity and social production as a whole. And I think we need to make sure that we're paying careful attention to this balance between the folks who are on the inside, the folks who are on the outside, and the, 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 the the potential for challenges between norms-based rules and what we might otherwise see in legal regimes. Right, so this is my suggestion for you guys for the rest of the day. Thanks again for, for having me on. This So, uh, no slides. Uh, so, um, in my, uh, just, just as a sort of a disclaimer, um, lest anybody get uh, grand ideas, my, my, my day work as a, a lawyer for the technology sector has really little or no bearing on, on the subject of cocktails. Um, it would probably be a more interesting job if, if that were the case, but this is just a subject of sort of academic interest uh, for me. Um, and uh, so what I'm talking about is, is to some degree uh, a subset of what Chris was discussing, uh, specifically intellectual property as it relates to cocktails. Um, and I, I, I will draw a few sort of parallels to the technology sector where I think it's, it's sort of interesting, but I'll, I'll confess that those aren't fully developed and I'd be interested in your thoughts. Um, so um, similar to what Chris was saying, the, the sort of orthodox canonical exception, uh, understanding of intellectual property would suggest that we have an undersupply in, in cocktail recipes for pretty much the same reason we would anticipate seeing them uh, in recipes, uh, conventional recipes, that is there's no intellectual property protection, the recipe is a public good, therefore uh, free riding would, would lead it to be underproduced. Um, and so, uh, you know, when you look around the universe at, at uh, the culinary universe, it, it, at, at bars and so on, we actually see a lot of cocktails. And in fact, we're in the midst of uh, sort of a craft cocktail renaissance. Uh, for better or worse, I mean, if you have issues with artisanal ice and, and homemade bitters and all this kind of nonsense, you might think it's very overwrought, but uh, there's actually a lot of development uh, in this area and, and a lot of interesting innovation happening at a grassroots level. Uh, and so uh, the question is sort of, um, you know, why and, uh, you know, might we envision an alternative uh, where an alternative environment where things would be different? And, and I think you, you could, in part because uh, the history of cocktails uh, is, is, it hasn't always sort of resided in the negative space of IP. In fact, the, the origins of cocktails are, are almost the, the poster child for modern intellectual property, uh, and that's, that's pharmacology. So the, if you really want to go way back uh, to to why we have cocktails, uh, you, you kind of have to start with um, uh, gout. <laughs> and <laughs> in, the, in the 1600s, uh, gout was a, a, a pretty much a highbrow affliction, right? If you had gout, you, you were doing pretty well because gout was associated with a, a, a particular kind of lifestyle and a particular kind of diet. Um, according to one medical treatise, it's associated with ease, voluptuousness, and high living. Uh, which, which frankly makes gout sound pretty awesome, right? Um, and and uh, because you have, I, I, my, my suspicion is that because you have a sort of elite market for the, the treatment of gout, uh, the, the medical practice moves away from the, the prevailing strategy at the time, which was bleeding and was not a, a very desirable uh, method of treatment, and towards the administration of tinctures or, or elixirs. Uh, and uh, by the early 1700s, we start to see the British uh, patents for uh, early elixirs 
um, what we would now refer to today as, as patent medicines, uh, which, which of course is where we get the term patent medicine, um, and, and not just for uh, the treatment of gout, but, but ultimately for the treatment of lots and lots of different uh, medical conditions. Uh, you know, from, from gout to stupidity to, to strange vague conditions like biliousness and uh, you know, and that sort of leads that sort of leads us into the food and drug law, right? Because by 1905, we've got the Pure Food and and, and Drug Act, um, because you know people are, are consuming snake oil. But in the intervening period, we actually see uh, the development of cocktails as a delivery mechanism for medicines, right? Because really, these early medicines that I'm talking about are the the the, the proto uh, bitters that we now consume, and you know when you're uh, you know, next putting Angostura in your old fashioned or, or Peshouts in your Sazerac or whatever, uh, you know, you can be thinking that the, the roots of that was, was treating gout 300 years ago. Uh, and it was sort of viewed as a, a sort of medicine. It was something you could self-medicate with. Um, and uh, because these things tended to be astringent, it was, it was widely accepted that you would often mix them with alcohol, whether it was, you know, sherry or, or brandy. Uh, which, which is kind of funny because if it's gout, that's yeah. sort of what you got to this, got you in the trouble in the first place. Uh, but remember, it's like 17th century medicine, right? So positive effect. Uh, but anyway, so, so we're looking for delivery mechanisms for this sort of quasi-medicinal stuff, and, and sherries and brandies were one of the, the primary, uh, the, the, any fortified wines were sort of the primary uh, mechanism. So uh, that is, in many sense, the, the sort of the, the roots of the modern cocktail. You know, originally it was for your health, and then by the 1800s it was for your health, and nowadays we, we drink to your health, right? And we've sort of migrated from medicine to social consumption. Um, and, and of course this is all happening without any, any sort of uh, IP. But, but there's actually two competing narratives there. Uh, the, the sort of social consumption that is blending uh, bitters with alcohol and, and to really get a sort of what we think of a modern cocktail, you've got sugar and water in there too, but this, this blending is all happening outside of IP. But, but as I pointed out, you know, we're seeing both patents and trade secrets on the formulas themselves. So on the input side, there's actually a decent amount of intellectual property. It's, it's the, the sort of mixing the recipe side where we don't have IP, right? So there, there's a change sort of in the commodity chain uh, from from no I, from IP to no IP. Um, so so what you know? How does that leave us uh, getting up to today? Um, the still today we, we see sort of more or less the same theme. Uh, the the f most of the commodity chain a lot of IP, right? So from the production of alcohol and the sale of alcohol, we we see geographic indicators, uh, certification marks, trademarks. Uh, the alcohol makes its way to the bar where uh, patented barware is used to produce your drink, but then the actual service of producing the drink still today, there's you know, very little uh, IP involved in that. Um, so the, the one, what's interesting in, in this sort of area is that uh, we also in the early 20th century in the United States have prohibition. Uh, so while all the earlier parts of that commodity chain are, are, are largely unaffected because many liquors are produced overseas and of course the, the, the hardware has already been developed, uh, the, the service industry for producing liquor is, is pretty much wiped out. Right? If you're a, a really good bartender or, or a mixologist as the term came to evolve, uh, you might move overseas uh, and, and practice your trade abroad. Uh, many bartenders just sort of left the industry. Right? So for a period of about 14 years in the early 20th century, we, we pretty much wiped out the knowledge base in that part of the commodity chain. Uh, and, then, and then we brought it back. And well, interestingly, almost immediately, we, we see a lot of development. Right? So the, uh, now it's, it's kind of ridiculous, but the, the tiki phase of, of cocktails was, was a, a pretty interesting period of innovation. It brought us cocktails that we still widely consume today, like the Mai Tai and the Zombie. Uh, and, and was for a period a very sort of high class form of entertainment, which is funny because we sort of think of tiki as very sort of cheap, uh, but it wasn't in the 1930s. Uh, and this, this happens almost immediately after, um, after prohibition. So um, we're, we're at this point now where uh, we have a, you know, sort of a long commodity chain, most of which is protected by IP. The service at the end is not. And, and I think there's a, a decent argument to make that uh, we're seeing as much or maybe even more innovation in the non-protected end of the, of the chain. Uh, and, and why is that? Uh, I think 
uh, folks in this room have all offered a lot of plausible reasons for that. Uh, first of all, um, uh, as, as Professor Sprigman and Rastiala point out in uh, Knockoff Economy, cocktails are, are, are not just a service, but a performance. And so you're not so much selling the good, but the service. And therefore, the IP in the good, even if appropriated, doesn't replicate the service. Right? It's, it's why you know, you're, um, they're, they're, you're likely to see that the, the handlebar mustaches and the bracers and the whole, the whole uh, apparatus of, of the modern cocktail craze is, is about a performance, right? And that can't be replicated. That is selling the scarcity. The IP is, is non-scarce. It's easily replicable. It's, it's, uh, it's non-rivalrous and, and difficult to exclude. Uh, the, the service of providing the drink in the bar is, is very excludable, right? There's a, there's a finite amount of labor uh, and particularly skilled labor that can do that. Another interesting uh, reason why I think we're seeing a lot of development here, which is something that I, I, I think there's, there's possible links to the, the technology sector, is that the cocktails, there's a lot of development around cocktails to sell the product. And that's development often by the manufacturers of particular liquors, who increasingly hire brand ambassadors to not just evangelize their product, but to devise recipes for the use of their product to ensure that the product sells. And, and that is, in a sense, it's a loss leader. It is a, uh, the development of IP in order to sell the, the, the non-scarce good, the liquor. Um, and one could argue that we, we're seeing an increasing amount of that in the technology sector with the, the development of software, which is an IP and not really, uh, it's just equally not excludable as, as a, a recipe, um, to, to move hardware. Right? So uh, big, Technology ecosystems, whether it's Apple or Android or even Microsoft, which just recently annou announced that it's going to start making uh, Office available for, for free in, in certain mobile environments, there are, they're hiring software developers who are coding products for free in the hopes that that sells the, the hardware. Right? And, and you could even say this was evolving uh, with Apple trying to create the iTunes store in order to sell its own hardware. In other words, the non-scarce goods are being used to drive demand for the scarce goods. And, and I think that the, whether it's a, a cocktail recipe or a software app, we're, we're pretty much looking at the same sort of business model. Um, and then finally, there's, there's other reasons why, why, why uh, cocktails are being developed. Reputational gain for the establishment, much like Chris was saying, you know, uh, knowing how to make the thing is not the same as, as having Michael Keller or a prominent bartender make it for you. So um, I think there's some uh, you know, interesting uh, parallels that we can draw both between food and cocktails and also between cocktails and the development of technology products I'd be happy to talk about further, but I'll wrap it up there. So we want to start by giving the two of you an opportunity to, to sort of um, you know, ask each other questions, sort of engage, uh, and then we'll open things up for the audience. Uh, sure, great. So, I mean, like, this is, this is lots of fun. This is, you know, I, you know, I feel like maybe this should have been the last talk rather than the first so we could all head straight to the bar rather than, uh, yeah. like, you know, or like that there really needs to be like a, you know, a Bellini cart or something. But uh, in any, yeah, no, so this is, I mean, you know, the, the, the extent to which, right, there's driving of the, uh, of the creativity by, by the companies themselves certainly seems to be, you know, playing a big role here, right? That, you know, I mean, you see this all the time, right? The people are in the bar and they're like, here, try this and do it this way. Right. Uh, I mean, so how is that responded to? Do you have a sense by the the like the real like like the guys with the mustaches and the man buns right, and the yeah. right? Like you know, does that seem less authentic to them when 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 like you know, Verne Branca is showing up saying like you know, splash it around this way, do all of this stuff? Right? Does that get diminished in its like whatever creativity, authenticity, value because it's coming from the man rather than like the man bun? So, I, I mean, I, I have, one of the first instances that got me thinking about that particular question was seeing professional bartenders diminishing brand ambassadors as, as a, a marketing vehicle. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of saying, you know, these guys are ruining it for the rest of us, right? And, but I, I found myself thinking, is that any different from uh, the producers of creative goods complaining that the technology sector is commodifying their, 
their creative contributions in order to sell their ecosystems or their um, or, or their uh, their hardware. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I think it's it's a it's a valid complaint. Uh, anytime someone is sort of commodifying your industry to to advance their own, right. that your that sort of disruptive uh, disruptive business model is is threatening. Right. Uh, and I think there are some bartenders who um, who perceive that. Although, insofar as you accept that what you're really providing is a service and not a product, uh, you know, I don't really think the. The, the creation of the recipe is, is a competing good. Unless mm -hmm. you're, of course, somebody who makes their business writing cocktail recipes. Now, right, which I, doesn't I, see, that's, that's not really a, a bit, right? Like what David Wondrich maybe does that and like, but not for the most part, right? That's yeah, and less of a, you know, probably, probably makes a lot more money doing, you know, speaking engagements right. and so on, right? Again, selling the scarcity of, of his time. So it seems like there's another, th so this, this is something that's always interested me about certainly the, you know, creativity in food. And it's certainly, it's true in cocktails and it's true in some of the other industries that we might talk about. It's like, it's, it's the, the competing ways in which consumers value on the one hand, creativity and novelty. And on the other hand, tradition and authenticity, right? Like, so there are many times when, you know, you go to a bar and you really don't like, you know, like you've seen like the, you know, the, the, the bartender, like, you know, Mr. Mixologist video online, right? You don't need something with a giant, like, being you know, a piece of whatever coming out of it, right? You just want an old fashioned, right? You're like, <laughs> I want an aviation, pour me an aviation, that's what I want, right? And I don't need the next most creative thing. And the same thing is true in cooking, right? There are times when mm -hmm. the thing that you desire is, in fact, you know, something wildly creative. I've never really had, you know, these kinds of tastes before. And there are other times when you want bolognese. Right. And so, you know, it's interesting that there are and, and many of these chefs, right, are and, and I think, you know, the cocktail folks as well are, are, are kind of walking a line of, you know, creativity and authenticity, trying to sell some to some people and others to other people. And it's, it's interesting to watch the ways in which I, you know, I, people within the industries perform and negotiate and, and, and negotiate these kinds of demands by their audiences, right, that we are. Yeah, and, and, so, and sometimes you see these segmented, right? Like at, you know, Moto restaurant, it's all super, you know, futuristic, right? And there are bars which are super futuristic, right? And then, you know, there are cocktail bars which are like, you know, it's just only cocktails from the 30s, right? Or it's only like tiki stuff that you would have had back in, right? And others where it's all wild and crazy and novel, right? So I think a lot of that is, I mean, my, my suspicion is, is that a lot of that is being driven by sort of segmentation in the home too is is sort of Americans maybe Western consumers in general become more more competent in the the the, the kitchen uh, and certainly behind their own bar the that there's a demand to provide a more differentiated and exotic service which might be you know I mean the the foodie uh, craze might be a sort of organic evolution of the competence of Americans in the kitchen right. and and if that's the case then it it really would be uh, driven by innovation which gets me thinking to you know it may be that that upper end of the segment could fit into the sort of canonical understanding of, of IP, that innovation there could be driven by, uh, by IP rights. And, and, and which is why I sometimes find myself thinking, can, could we get over uh, the, it, let me say this another way, if we wanted to create an IP regime for, the, for sort of the most elaborate end of the market, could we? Right. And I think with cocktails, I, I, have, I have my doubts, if only because you have all these sort of merger issues uh, or, or scenes of fare. I mean, look, you've got between three and six ounces of liquid to, to divide in equal measures. There's only so many permutations in which you can do that, right? I mean, it really is uh, finite, but maybe not so much in the culinary space. I, I don't know if folks saw there was recently a, a, a trademark lawsuit in litigation in Texas between these two pizza restaurants. Uh, and and I, I think, I, I have to confess, I haven't actually read the opinion, just read press accounts, but I think there was some suggestion that maybe in, in plating there could actually be trademark. And I find myself thinking, well, you know, that might be a plausible theory, one that wouldn't necessarily map into the cocktail space, because in the end it's all got to go into a vessel, um, but maybe not so in, in food. Yeah, but certainly the, some of the vessels are subject to intellectual property rights. Right. Uh, it, well, yeah, sure. So, right. yeah. I, I, but it's um, 
Yes. But yeah. Yeah. But the, yeah. Yeah. So if you want to Sorry bring to in other people, we can just chat yeah. about stuff all day. I know. Yeah. Well, I know, I'll but I really, I'm sure that's entertaining that for you if we sit up here and like yeah. questions. I know I do, but um, actually, I think we're gonna have people come up here and ask if that's all right. Sorry. There's another mic on the, the side. The microphones aren't wireless, sure. unfortunately. So I was also really delighted to see the pizza case because in my trademark law class a year or two ago, I gave my students a hypo based on the possible trade dress protection for the Primanti sandwich in <laughs> Pittsburgh, the fries in the sandwich thing. Uh, the actual question though, uh, it starts with Chris's presentation. Um, a lot of what you talked about sort of made sort of an implicit structural claim about producers and consumers and transactions and recipes as kind of the manifestation of creativity. Right. Um, so what if you take that sort of, uh, sort of infrastructure, if you will, sort of out of the equation and posit that the consumer interest in demand for this kind of knowledge is based not on interest in access to the recipes, but interest in other sorts of things. For example, I want to watch, I want to watch Ina Garten or Rachel Ray or Martha Stewart, not because I want access to the information, but I want to be sort of, I posit myself in their position. I want to develop that, that set of skills and, and crafts so I might not actually be able to produce food in exactly that way, but I hypothesize that I could, and that's a kind of information creativity exchange that's the IP system doesn't necessarily recognize what I think might actually be going on in this space. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. I mean, this is, I mean, this is one of the things that is certainly happening an awful lot, right? The things that are getting, the, the things that people are purchasing are not necessarily the recipes, right? The, 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 you know, the, the things that the consumers value is not necessarily the recipe, the, the creativity inherent in the recipe itself. Um, nonetheless, we see an awful lot of production of putatively creative recipes, right? And there seems to be some idea that like, you know, when you're watching Ina Garten cook, it's not just because Ina Garten is, 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 is cooking with some technique or something, but she's cooking like better dishes or more interesting dishes or more creative dishes or like, you know, like that whatever Guy Fieri does, right? Like, <laughs> like this abomination of a human being, right? Is like, you know, valuable in some special way, right? And like, you know, that he's contributing something. So, so you know, th but there's, there certainly is like, I mean, th th it might be that the, the people are not buying, right? The, 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 the things that are actually being sold and consumed aren't necessarily the recipes, but the recipes are still being produced at enormously high rates to fill up all of these books and all of these magazines, right? Like there's, you know, like, you know, you pull up, you open up Bon Appetit and it's got 200 recipes in it, right? That, you know, somebody had to produce somewhere, right? Some of which are copied from somewhere, but like there's an awful lot of intellectual effort going into them. I just, just wanted, oh. No. Oh, I, I just, one thought on, um, you know, the, the notion that the, that the, I think there's, if you look, there's, there's a lot of sort of cookbooks, for, you know, cocktail books are, are now becoming incredibly popular too. And if you buy one on Amazon, you like the Amazon suggestions just bury you, right? So, so there's some, some, some programmer at Amazon thinks that I have a serious problem right? because I'm just, so, and, and yet, so I think that's interesting because that is a place where the skill disclosed in the recipe is, is relatively small, right? So you can pretty much reproduce everything that you read in a cocktail cookbook, which is to say that all the knowledge that it conveys is actually in the book. So I, I'm, I can buy Thomas Keller's cookbook and I'm never gonna be able to reproduce that, right? So you might say, okay, well, it's plausible that he would say he's gonna sell those things because it's not actually gonna disclose any information that, that he, uh, that, that he has to worry about competition, right? But it's not so in cocktails. It's just, it's a far simpler, uh, it's, it's a far simpler exercise. And, and so that means that that, that even when it's very simple to replicate, it still doesn't seem to be undermining the demand, which f for, the, for the, the, the service being disclosed, which takes me back to the notion that it's really about the, the non-scarce product is either marketing for or, or promotion for or selling the, the scarce service of, of administering the, the good. It, just to add on to that, um, I've kind of personally noticed a trend in cookbooks towards telling personal stories around the dishes. And so I was wondering, first of all, if that exists in cocktail books as well, whether, you, whether you've seen any trends like this, like I've seen personally, and whether there are any parallels to Chris Brigman's work on stand-up comedians and kind of uh, how the jokes have changed to more like personalized storytelling in order to protect them from being copied. 
Yeah, well, yeah, so I hadn't thought about that, but I actually think that's a totally valid um, hypothesis. I mean, certainly a lot of uh, the, the cocktail books are very uh, focused on, on history and, and narrative about the development of the goods. And, I, you know, I don't know if that's a direct response to the need to produce a copyrightable work, whereas the, the, the steps and processes of, of the recipe would not be protected. I, I think that's, that's just what the, the marketplace um, demands. But it is interesting that, that we see the, the product migrating towards something that is protectable. Whether, whether I, but I, I don't, my, my, my gut instinct is that that's not an intentional uh, transformation. If we write this kind of book, we'll be able to get copyright protection. I think it's just that's what people want. There's also, I think, some change in you know the glossiness and sexiness of the kinds of books that get produced, right? If you look back at the book cookbooks of a generation ago, right, they don't have splashy pictures. They're not high gloss, right? And a lot of these, like the thing that you're consuming, is much more like a you know gorgeous work of art than it is a disclosure of information about how to prepare some dish, right? Like you know, I've got the El Bouilly cookbook. It's 900 pages, and I never really opened it other than to like flip through pretty pictures of stuff, right? Like so, it's not about that at all. And and of course, these are the kinds of things that are very difficult to copy, right? At least difficult to copy in certain kinds of ways. Like they look not so great on something like this, right? So yeah. So I I guess that that does get to what I wanted to talk about because. I wonder whether we're talking about the right locus of creativity. So I've heard you both talk a lot about the creativity at the level of the individual recipe, right? Uh, which I think is, I think, a, the starting point. I wonder though we, whether we need to also talk about creativity at the level of curation, right? Which is maybe where the relevant transactional element of the creativity takes place. And I'd be interested to hear what you guys have to say about sort of the act of curation and the value of sort of how people are curating, you know, put it, bringing it together, maybe telling the story, and how much of that is considered the act of creation and, what, and the value that comes from that that makes it maybe easier to appropriate even in the absence of intellectual property protection. It's certainly, I mean, so this is certainly a, a pose that a number of people in the industry take at various times, right? So, so like, you know, Mario Batali, for example, Right, like, you know, Mario Batali is an incredibly inventive and creative chef, but one of the things that he wants you to think is that, like, he has a bunch of little old Italian ladies back in the kitchen cooking, like, traditional little old Italian lady dishes, right? And the same thing with, like, Paula Wolfer, right? Paula Wolfer's thing is, like, like, I'm not a brilliant chef, right? What I've done is I've spent the last 10 years of my life going around southwest France, eating and cooking all of these things to learn the appropriate ways to do it, and I've brought them all together, and I'm circulating them back to you. Uh, but of course, you know, if that's the case, right, if that's the effort that she's engaged in, right, which is again, right, you know, this, and this is a problem, right, this is where the social norms problem bumps up against, you know, against what intellectual property wants to do, right, her, 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 her incredibly difficult labor of curation obtains for her almost no valuable intellectual property, but when it gets, when it gets pirated, right, people like her get deeply, deeply, deeply upset. Right? You didn't go out and talk to a hundred little French ladies to figure out what's the best way to make cassoulet. I did, right? And this is mine because I was the one who I created this from going. And and so and this is a problem in which you know the norms about what's protectable from within the the the, the social group differ from the, the 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 general rules that we would otherwise embody in an intellectual property law. So I've been thinking, uh, I was thinking when each one of you was talking about how um, the prevalence of copying may uh, to some extent be driving new creation um, in the way that it does, for example, for, for K-pop. Right? There's so much new K-pop because it can only be uh, Korean pop music. Okay. Right? There's, only, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of new Korean pop music because you can only actually sell a Korean pop song for like 10 minutes before it gets copied. And, uh, and so you have to keep making new ones if you want to sell anything because you cannot sell an old one ever. Um, and so I wonder whether there is uh, a whether to some extent, for example, the increased glossiness of cookbooks and the uh, the 
avalanche of cocktail books may to some extent reflect more copying uh, and, and be a sort of attempt to keep up with that. So what I think with the, in the, with the K-pop example, I would speculate that if one dis or sort of inspected the, 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 the components of production in that industry, you'd find a lot of lower production costs, efforts to, to turn the product out faster. Um, and insofar as there's an analog for that in the, um, in the, the cocktail space, I think, or well, and, and also the, the recipe space, I think we'd see sort of cheaper cookbooks coming out, right? You, that's, that would be the, maybe the analogy, but, but we don't, right? We see, on the contrary, it's, it's, all, it's all food porn now. And uh, so, I mean, that's just one observation that might suggest it's not happening. Um, I, I, I think there's also just a tradition in the food service industry to, to change to, to provide things, whether it's with the seasons or, or whatever, to sort of mix up the menu a lot, uh, because which I think is further consistent with the fact that it's it's an experience good, and that's been established for uh, you know kind of a long time. So I, I don't really see any evidence of that, but I, I agree that we would expect to see it, and. I, um, well, as with fashion too, we might want to think about whether this is good, yeah. right? Um, you know, so so you know, what, you know, one of the problems in all of these areas is that you know, I mean, maybe what we're seeing is that people feel compelled to be more creative, because you know, republishing the you know, like the one great bolognese recipe doesn't get you an awful lot, right? And it turns out there's one great bolognese recipe, and right, and you don't really need you know, fifteen bolognese recipes once the one that's awesome has been disclosed, right? And now everyone's adding, you know, this and that, right? You've got one with exo sauce and here's one with shrimp paste and here's another one with kimchi, right? And like, it's entirely possible that this is not actually improving anyone's welfare in any sense, right? In the same way that, right, you know, the rapidity of the fashion cycle isn't, right? and this gets back to incredibly difficult questions of aesthetic progress and what do we mean by, you know, the, you know what's the relationship between markets and progress? What's the relationship between aesthetics and progress? You know, how should we care about any of these questions? Good, I've made Chris mad. Uh, so he's gonna, <laughs> uh, so really, but this is right, you know, we, we don't know whether we're there. All right. We have, we have, we have to call it. All right, I'm sorry. Oh. Uh, <laughs> anticipation uh, for, for future interaction. Um, so uh, we're, gonna, uh, we're gonna bring up our next uh, couple of uh, presenters. Um, it's going to require a little bit of uh, technical intervention because uh, we had a uh, last minute um, uh, travel hiccup and so uh, Michael Mattioli is going to be joining us uh, via Skype so uh, Kate is going to, okay, yes, yeah, sure, sure. Oh, yes. Yeah. I know. No. She's just, she's just getting things to set up on the table. Just like. Try to. It's it's very. Uh, awesome, isn't it? It's personal. Oh, nice.
Hello? <gasps> Yay, it works. Can you oh, hear me? Oh, great. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can't see you. Uh, oh. Should, is there a way to have him see the room? Where's our tech team? I guess you'll just have to uh, imagine everyone in their underwear. Oh, well, that's much easier for me. Do you want to introduce our panel? Uh, yeah, so um, our, our, next, uh, our next panel is going to be talking about healthcare innovation. Uh, up first, joining us uh, via the magic of the internet is uh, Mike Mattioli from the University of Indiana. Uh, after that, uh, we have uh, Kathy Strandberg uh, from uh, NYU, and hopefully our um, uh, sort of uh, uh, conversational component of the panel is going to work out well. We will see how that happens. So, uh, Mike, you're up first. Okay, and I, I should mention, I had to hit a little icon that was like a picture of a video camera um, for you to see me, so I don't know if the same thing on that end would work, but I'm also fine just imagining all of you, so that works as well. Um, thank, thank you so much. I should also say um, I'm so sorry that I can't be there today. I, uh, I don't know if Aaron and Kate had the chance to explain. I uh, had a health issue that kept me here at home in Bloomington. I, I really wanted to join all of you, but I'm so happy that at least we can do this this way. It's the second best, but um, thank you. Um, also, the sound, uh, the way that the sound works with the video conferencing, I found can be problematic. We had a, a conference here a couple weeks ago with people dialing in over Skype from Germany, and everyone was talking over everybody else. I'm sure you all already know. So. Um, Forgive me if I interrupt you. I, I'm not a rude person. Um, blame Skype, please. Um, OK, so I thought I would use the time today to describe uh, my current research. Um, I'll first give you a 50,000 foot view of what I'm researching. Um, I'm on research leave, so this has really occupied a lot of my time. I'll then go into a little bit more detail. I know we have um, Aaron or Kate. Is it just 10 to 15 minutes? Uh, yeah, 15. OK, great. So um, the 50,000 foot view to start off with, I'm, I'm conducting a set of ethnographic case studies of private organizations uh, that aim to aggregate healthcare data. And this is in keeping with a lot of my research. Um, my broader research agenda focuses on the role of private ordering in the world of innovation. So in the past, for those of you familiar with my work, I've, I've written about patent pools um, and other types of IP licensing groups. Big data has been the latest thing that I'm looking at. And it's interesting. A lot of the subject matter isn't really covered by formal IP. Much of it is trade secrecy, um, or much of it would fall under trade secrecy. And what I'm learning as I go into this more and more is how very, very different it is from um, those canonical IP licensing groups like, like patent pools. Um, so the groups that I'm studying are, there are four of them. Cancer Link is organized by the American Society of Clinical Oncologists. Um, the uh, a second one is the Cancer Commons. It's a nonprofit that aims to get health data directly from patients. Project Data Sphere is uh, organized by pharmaceutical companies including Pfizer and Celgene. And the Data Alliance Collaborative is an organization um, composed of healthcare institutions that are trying to not gather data, but gather methods of drawing meaning from data. And all of these groups really are trying to do that on some level. The overriding theme here is if we could somehow get health data describing patients from multiple sources it would be possible to improve patient care. Um, so one example of that, uh, I guess CancerLink offers a good example, just to sort of help you picture this. Um, if you imagine a, a cancer doctor in Bloomington, Indiana, who has a patient that presents, and the 80-year-old patient presents with a certain type of cancer, that doctor at that hospital might not have ever encountered a, a patient just like this one. And that's often the case. Um, so he has very little to go on in terms of how a certain drug will affect that patient. Um, 
he might look or she might look to clinical trials, but clinical trials represent an incredibly small percentage of patients as a whole. So for, I've heard various statistics, but around 4% of patients are represented in clinical trials. The dream of these efforts is that this doctor in the future could say, okay, there's no one in Bloomington like my patient, but here's 20 people around the country very much like my patient. I can see how they've responded to various treatments and devise a treatment that would be more likely to work. So that's the, the big picture here, and it's very much what big data is about. Um, one of the challenges of writing about big data is that there's like 50 definitions, and no one agrees uh, on what big data is. But when I talk about it, I'm really referring to this idea of gathering data from multiple sources and drawing some new meaning from it. So it's really a, a method or methodology. That's the 50,000 foot view. Um, my research project is prompted by what seems like uh, some trouble on the horizon for big data. Um, on the one hand, there's incredible enthusiasm, both from uh, private investors and the public um, institutions as well. Our government has invested heavily in big data. Um, that enthusiasm seems to be propelled in part by the hope that big data will be an engine for innovation. Um, and it seems like there's some truth to that. There have been patent filings in the last couple of years focused on um, or claiming methods of drawing new meaning from data, methods of normalizing data. In other words, when you take data from multiple sources, it's often very involved to, um, cur to sort of put it in a common format that will allow for meaningful aggregation. And finally, methods of obfuscating personally identifiable information from data. So this is the dream, this is the hope of innovation. Um, juxtaposed against that is uh, there are voices of dissent in uh, the world of computer science and informatics. Leading commentators in the world of computer science, uh, Christine Borgman at UCLA writes uh, quite a bit on big data. She said this, the dirty little secret, was her phrase, of big data is that very little sharing may actually be taking place. Um, and other, uh, her colleagues at other institutions, other schools have expressed similar concern that perhaps we shouldn't expect private institutions out of a sense of enlightened self-interest to willingly gather, uh, I'm sorry, willingly share data with one another. Um, that in fact there are costs and risks involved with this and um, you, we shouldn't be so sure that this is just going to happen automatically. Maybe there's a need for government intervention of some kind. Um, that's the question that I'm looking at. So my research question is really to what extent should we expect these efforts to just sort of arise naturally um, as products of the market. In order to study this question, I um, have been conducting interviews. So my approach is ethnographic. Actually, uh, Kathy, um, your, although we can't see you, I know you're there, um, your framework studying knowledge commons has uh, been the framework that I've used in conducting interviews with scientists, doctors, entrepreneurs, people at these four organizations and also people working at member institutions, um, places, uh, institutions that have joined these efforts. And um, really, uh, my questions have focused on what are these groups trying to accomplish? Um, what are the costs and risks associated with sharing data? And do you have any successes that you can point to? Or really, are these efforts facing a lot of challenges? I should mention as an aside, I chose healthcare partly out of convenience. Um, it's the first industry where I was able to see a lot of organizations that look like data pools taking form. There are other industries, agriculture is one, where it seems like similar efforts are, are forming. But healthcare, that, that was why I chose healthcare and medical research. So I could describe quickly what I've found. Um, also, m might I ask it?
how much time I have left? I, I've lost my timer here. Six minutes. Six minutes, okay. All right, I'm gonna go fast. Um, or I'll try. One thing I've discovered is an incredible diversity of data. Um, if you set out in this task that these four groups have set out upon to try to um, improve healthcare by gathering patient data, there are so many things that you might, in a perfect world, want. Um, everything from demographic data, records of medical visits, handwritten doctor notes some groups are trying to gather, um, medication history. So there's an incredible diversity of data, and as you might imagine, that presents incredible costs and challenges um, when you try to aggregate it in a meaningful way. It's not just like you put this all on a computer and you're all set. It's very costly. There's also an incredible diversity of players, um, patients, doctors, hospitals, nonprofits, universities, pharmaceutical corporations, electronic health record companies play a huge role in this space and um, they're very jealous with their data. They hold on to their data very closely and keep it in proprietary formats that make it difficult to um, make use of outside. Insurance companies are deeply interested in uh, big data in the world of healthcare as well. So many different types of data, many different players, and uh, many challenges as it turns out. So I'll outline those quickly here and then hopefully if there are questions afterwards, I could describe those in greater detail. Um, preparing data is surprisingly costly. Um, so actually just getting data into a format that allows for meaningful deductions to be drawn. Um, preparing data is also very messy. Data is much less objective than you would guess. Um, there's often a lot of holes in data. One example is, um, this is an anecdote that I think Kathy has heard me describe before. Um, one healthcare institution that I spoke with was a, a Catholic healthcare group. They wanted to, to participate in a government-led effort to aggregate healthcare data. And they discovered when they started gathering all their data together that there was a problem with their records. Um, their patients had been uh, uniformly mislabeled. Uh, transgendered patients were not labeled male or female, uh, their biological sex, but they were labeled unknown. And this made it impossible, or at least not meaningful, for the healthcare data to be aggregated with a larger pool. So this institution hired an informaticist, a data expert, who I interviewed, he described how Basically, he guessed whether a given patient labeled unknown was a man or a woman. And um, he did this by looking at things like height, weight, the type of cancer that a person was being treated for. And he was the first to say his methods were sort of chosen in an ad hoc fashion. He might have gotten many wrong. Um, this information of how the data was prepared, how his guesses were made, is really valuable. You would want this if you were going to reuse the data in the future. For example, if you're doing a population scale study of how often cancer occurs in America, you might not care that some men were labeled as women um, or some males were labeled as females. If you were devising the course of treatment for one individual patient, you would care very much maybe that um, the biological sex was mislabeled. So there's a lot of messiness in this data and that also leads to another problem that uh, there are significant risks involved with sharing data. Um, hospitals are concerned about running afoul of privacy regulations, HIPAA in particular. Um, there's uh, sort of an atmosphere of risk when you speak with um, administrators within hospitals who are considering participating. Um, so the problems, the challenges that I've found to summarize them with the time I have, um, hospitals are reluctant to share data, first because of health, uh, because of privacy concerns, second because there are concerns that sharing data might reflect poorly on their course of treatment. So they might not want to make public the fact that many of their patients um, don't have a good outcome when they're treated uh, at that institution. 
pharmaceutical companies have, from what I've seen, a different set of concerns or a different perception of risk. They're concerned about sharing data that might allow a competitor to design around an existing patent. Um, so specifically, this is data that's produced in the course of um, conducting clinical trials. Um, finding information about what worked and what didn't work could allow a competitor to design around very efficiently. And uh, people who I spoke with at Celgene and Pfizer voiced that concern. Academic researchers, it's no big surprise, um, are often reluctant to share data that could allow them to uh, publish. Um, maybe some people in the room have experienced this personally. I, I know I have. I've at times had data I've collected and I've thought I should hold on to this for a little while. So medical researchers certainly uh, face that concern. And against all of these disincentives is a general perception that the gains, the potential gains of cooperation are uh, speculative. That there might be great stuff that could come out of sharing data, but it's unclear as yet to the players whether those benefits will be realized by them personally or by their industry as a whole. So uh, if I had to summarize everything I found through these interviews, I can conducted about 30 so far, each lasting about an hour, it's, um, it's that. The big takeaway is that the, the costs and the risks feel very immediate and um, easy to calculate. The benefits feel more speculative. So uh, it's a landscape not defined yet by innovation and success. It's defined, as far as I can see, by struggle and uh, frustration and, and maybe a need for policy intervention. What that would look like uh, I think is a broader question. And I realize my time is up, so I, I will silence myself. Um, and uh, thank you. Thank you so much. I look forward to uh, questions. Thank you so much, Mike. I sent you an email, but we might have to put you in the background while we have Kathy present. But there is a webcast that you can watch. Oh, I've got it right here. Thank you. Cool. All right. I don't know if he can hear applause, but it would be appropriate. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, well, thanks. Thank you very much. And um, I'm starting to feel very guilty about Mike because this is the, s the second time in a row that he and I were supposed to be in the same place at the same time and something happened that he couldn't make it. <laughs> so maybe if you want to see Mike, you shouldn't invite me whenever the next <laughs> event is. Um, but anyway, uh, I I'm going to talk today about um, some interesting, I think, history about the attitudes that physicians have had about um, innovation and patenting. Um, so my motivation for this work, it really comes from two strands of, of my research and, and research that I'm interested in. The first one is research on user innovation, um, building on work by Eric von Hippel and others, um, which looks at situations in which the primary or a primary motivation for innovation is uh, wanting to use it yourself. Um, and what's known from the work of those scholars about user innovation is that at least in many circumstances, user innovators uh, participate in communities and share their uh, innovations. Um, and basically one way to look at that is to say, is to say why should that happen for, for user innovators in particular, it's that use value often is at least partially non-rival. So you can share it but still re retain value for yourself. The second um, background motivation for uh, this study is some work I've been doing that actually Mike uh, Mattioli just referred to um, with Mike Madison, who's sitting out there, and Brett Frischman on um, trying to understand the way in which knowledge commons um, are governed uh, by doing various case studies. Um, and so this kind of leads to a general, me to a general interest in uh, comparative institutional analysis of IP and other kinds of systems for producing innovation. Uh, so why look at physicians? Um, my, my interest in looking at physicians uh, arises out of the following things. First of all, 
physicians are user innovators. Um, and in fact, they invent and sort of always have medical devices, medical procedures, off-label uses of drugs, um, and so forth. They also are in a community that has these very long-standing but evolving norms about patenting and sharing, so it's interesting to see how these norms have evolved over time. So uh, in the article that I'm talking about here, my goals were to sort of trace historically the evolution of physician patenting norms and to try from that to get some insights or build some hypotheses about uh, the relationship between innovative communities and the patent system. Um, so just a couple of uh, caveats or limitations on this work. Uh, the first one is uh, IANAH. I am not a historian, so I'm always a little nervous presenting this <laughs> historical study. Um, and another limitation is that I'm getting what I'm going to say about physician norms mostly from uh, official type documents, uh, AMA documents, also some news, uh, news articles and trade journals and things like that, but uh, this is not sort of real grassroots information. Um, so I'm going to try to talk about this history by framing it in terms of some stories. Um, these are actually all really fascinating stories that I could spend an hour telling you each one, and I will try not to do that, uh, about patents in the medical community. But I think these stories help to kind of frame the, the history and, and uh, explore the history. So I'm just going to start my story um, with the formation of the American Medical Association in the 1800s. Uh, actually in 1847. So there's a period of time from 1847 where I'm starting up till sometime in the early 1900s where we have physicians being the primary innovators in kind of all areas of medical technology. Uh, drugs, devices, procedures, diagnostics, etc. Physicians are the people doing the innovation. Throughout this whole time period, beginning right when the AMA was created in 1847, um, there is an ethical rule against patenting by physicians. So the 1847 Code of Ethics uh, says it's derogatory to professional character for a physician to hold a patent for any surgical instrument or medicine. Um, and this is taking place partly during a historical period where we have a fight going on between uh, ethical medicine and quackery. Um, and uh, this is also a period of time when we're dealing with so-called patent medicines, which are basically over-the-counter medicines, almost none of which actually are patented. Um, but nonetheless, it sort of gives the idea of patenting a bad name. Um, and apparently also I was very interested to hear that um, there's an, a big overlap between my research and the research on cocktails, which I never <laughs> would have anticipated, so that's really fascinating. Okay, so um, one of these sort of foundational uh, interesting stories about the development of these norms comes from the ether anesthesia patent controversy. Um, so this story um, is really a fascinating story, but I'll just tell you the br brief outline. So in the mid-1800s, we had a situation where surgery is basically done without anesthesia. Um, you might, you know, have some of those cocktails <laughs> to, uh, to kind of quell the pain. You might, you might uh, try to... Uh, uh, smoke some opium, things like that, but basically there's, there's no anesthesia. Um, this, of course, makes surgery horrible, uh, presumably for the surgeons as well as for the patients. Um, at the same time, there is this interesting, and uh, really interesting phenomenon of um, ether frolics, they're called. Um, basically, ether and also nitrous oxide being used as party drugs during this time. Um, and I have some little pictures up here from uh, some pictures from the time and comics and also um, an ad from the newspaper about uh, nitrous oxide. So there were both of these were used at parties. This was fairly socially acceptable as far as I'm able to be to tell. Um, also there were, it was used in uh, like big demonstrations where everybody, people would rent a hall in New York City, everybody would come to the hall and you know the, the, somebody would inhale nitrous oxide and stumble around on the stage and everybody would find this very entertaining. Um, so but it wasn't used for anesthesia, either, neither of them. Uh, and with ether, it was just because it was considered very dangerous to, um, to inhale too much. So ether was used for other uh, medical needs, but not for anesthesia. Um, but around this period of time, um, various people um, made claims to being the discoverer, uh, discoverers of ether anesthesia. 
Um, many of them because of these experiences with ether frolics, by the way. You know, like, wow, I had this huge gash on my knee from stumbling around at the ether frolic, and lo and behold, I didn't feel any pain. Um, so, uh, so these are some people who claim to have discovered ether anesthesia. There's lots to talk about, about all of them, all fascinating people, actually. Um, but the patent controversy comes from the fact that Morton, who was a dentist and also possibly, uh, fairly convincingly, I think, uh, kind of a scam artist, and Charles Jackson, who was a Harvard professor, um, a big po a polymath doing all kinds of stuff, and also somebody who really liked to dispute about priority of invention. He, he was uh, disputed that he had invented the telegraph, gun cotton, some things about digestion, and these ether anesthesia. Um, so Morton and Jackson together obtained this patent on ether anesthesia. And Jackson assigns his rights to Morton because it's kind of inappropriate for a Harvard professor to have a patent. Um, Bigelow, who at that time is a young surgeon and later becomes a very famous pers uh, person in the history of anesthesia research, um, publicizes um, Morton's cases and is one of the people who really publicizes ether anesthesia. Um, Jackson immediately, almost immediately begins to claim that it was all really his idea in the first place and, and he should have uh, gotten it. And there's this credit dispute that continues unabated for decades and actually even to this day, there is dispute about who really invented ether anesthesia. Um, but for our purposes, I think the interest, some of the interesting things are these. First of all, Bigelow writes um, about why it is, so there's, a, there's immediately a controversy about the fact that, that this, uh, Jackson and Morton have got taken out a patent on this. And Bigelow makes these fam really familiar sounding arguments in defense of Morton's patenting. Uh, he says, look, these guys are, are making, he's making licenses liberally available to the medical profession. Um, he, the pe person who discovers such a boon to humanity deserves compensation. Um, and we should worry that the invention might have slept for 20 years longer without Morton um, because he was willing to assume the responsibility of danger in experimenting and publicizing the discovery. Um, this is kind of interesting because I think it was really his patients who assumed the responsibility of danger <laughs> for the most part. Although most of these people also experimented on themselves. So they, they also assumed the responsibility of danger. Um, he also said, well, also we gotta excuse Morton because he's a dentist, not really trained in medical norms. So this gets at the insider outsider thing. Um, interestingly, uh, at this point, we also get um, from a group of dentists um, a very vigorous response saying, dentists have the same kinds of professional norms as physicians. This is not acceptable among dentists either. Um, and so, you know, Morton shouldn't have been patented. Um, then Morton goes around trying to monetize his patent. This also sounds kind of familiar. Um, he hires a bunch of licensing agents and sends them all over the place. He circulates this term sheet uh, about what, what he would charge for various licenses to dentists and surgeons. He advertises that he's willing to, to furnish trains anesthetists. Um, he also lobbied Congress for 25 years um, to get official credit and compensation for government use of ether anesthesia on the battlefield, which was extremely important um, around this time period when we had various wars, like the Civil War. Um, now, some people in the medical community supported his efforts to get recognition from Congress and to get recognition in general. Uh, there was a group in Boston that even established a fund for a testimonial prize for him, but most practitioners just refused to pay on the grounds that medical innovation shouldn't be patented. And you have these great quotes about saying medical innovation is a cumulative and communal activity. Um, so you have the, the first quotes the, that all of these improvements in medicine are from a succession of cooperative laborers. Also, that you don't really have a medical innovation until you have had the safety and efficacy investigated by the profession, which I think is very interesting. Okay, so then the next sort of history of this, which I'm gonna kind of skip over for purposes of time, has to do with the isolated adrenaline patent. Um, and this is the point at which we're, we're having the rise of the pharmaceutical industry. Drug innovation is no longer, physicians are doing it, it's pharmaceutical, it's chemistry companies that are doing it, it's becoming chemistry based. And at this time we have, Courts finding, uh, finding that um, drugs are patentable. Um, the medical community originally really opposes this, but eventually, especially as the FDA takes over for safety and efficacy re responsibility, 
this anti-patenting norm on drugs um, and also on devices is reversed in 1955. Um, so one of the things you can notice about this is that this happens at a time when drug innovation isn't a physician knowledge commons anymore. It's not a user innovator community. It's being performed by outsiders. Uh, and the safety and efficacy vetting is being performed by outsiders. So at this point, we have the anti-patenting norm basically going away. Now fast forward to the 1990s where we have a, a cataract surgery patent controversy. Um, so basically you have cataract surgery, you remove the lens, you insert an artificial replacement and lots of surgeons have developed and published improvements in this technique. In 1990, the biggest advan a big advance is sutureless surgery uh, because sutures have a tendency to cause problems during healing. Um, and in January 1990, you have the first performance of sutureless surgery by a guy named Mike McFarland. Um, in March, you have another guy, Stephen Seepster, showing his films of his procedure. Lots of people are racing to du duplicate and improve this procedure. Um, and one of the things that people thought might be important was the shape of the incision. Um, and so three of the people that were in interested in the shape of the incision are James Gill, Samuel Palin, and Jack Singer. Um, and all these people become very important in this patent controversy. Um, so, Palin goes ahead and patents his Chevron incision. Um, he was also being dissatisfied with the amount of credit he was getting from the medical community. And so he starts trying to eventually to enforce his patent. And he sues Singer, Jack Singer, for infringement. Um, big mistake, I probably, because it turns out that Singer not only refuses to pay, um, but sort of becomes the leader of this uh, movement opposing patents, procedure patents. Um, which brings Palin a lot of uh, recognition that he probably wasn't so happy about. Uh, and the, um, this physician anti-procedure patent movement um, is very interesting. The rhetoric is quite um, uh, inflammatory that people are using about how terrible this is, that people are patenting, um, patenting procedures. Um, and in fact, even though the case eventually um, goes away and the patent's found invalid, it spurs a whole um, movement to seek legislation barring medical procedure patents. Eventually that doesn't happen, but Congress does pass an exemption from infringement re remedies for doctors and related healthcare <coughs> entities. And also the AMA uh, adopts an explicit ethical opinion against the patenting of medical procedures. So what's going on here? We now have physicians who are perfectly happy to, that drugs are patented, that devices are patented, many physicians um, patent devices that they develop, um, but innovation, the procedure innovation um, is just, patenting a procedure innovation is just, you know, shocking, not just not done, but, you know, really shocking, horrible, et cetera. Um, so one possible explanation for this is that procedure innovation is still a user innovator community matter. Um, you don't need outsiders for it. You have an enforceable, you have norms that are enforceable through a reputation system. Um, and you have a, a system in which these procedures can be disseminated and people get credit for them through publication and other ways. Okay, so this leads up to the, the last thing I want to talk about, which is very recently, uh, the controversy over patenting of medical diagnostic tests. Um, so in this medical diagnostic patent controversy, one thing that is notable and interesting is that um, medical associations have been strongly involved in opposing these diagnostic patents. Um, so we've had at least three cases recently in which uh, that happened. Um, in fact, I, I actually, for disclosure, I wrote amicus briefs on behalf of the medical associations in the first two cases. Um, you ha we have a case in which the Supreme Court finds diagnostic procedures unpatentable. We have cases in which, um, which are actually brought by medical uh, professionals against DNA patents. Um, so why is, how does this fit in um, and why, why is this happening? Pat physicians aren't getting sued for this. Um, so one possibility is that we're still running into this, it, these norms of user innovator community sharing. Um, because diagnostic development is very often a collaboration between physicians and academic researchers. And you can basically argue that that was what was going on in all the cases that I mentioned. And if I had more time, I could tell you more about that. Um, so the question really is, um, what's going to happen from now on? So um, uh, Mike mentioned, Mike Medioli just mentioned this, that there are uh, 
there's, there's, idea, there's work going on to kind of put data together and come up with diagnostic procedures. Um, are these still going to be considered user innovation or is this going to change because of, for example, the increasing need for IT to develop these um, procedures um, and so forth? And I guess one prediction I might have that to the extent that um, it starts to become necessary to collaborate with outsiders in order to develop these, uh, these diagnostic procedures, you're going to see less, uh, you're going to see a lessening, uh, lessening of the um, uh, objections to um, diagnostic patents on the part of the medical community. Um, and so I'll stop there. much. I'm just going to try to bring Mike back so that, ah, he's still there. Hello. Hi. I'm going to make this. All right. Um, Hi, Mike. Hello. I, I first wanted to see whether you guys maybe had any comments for each other. You want to go first, first, Mike? You can go first. Okay. I'm, I'm going to get a drink, drink of water while you go first. Okay. Um, well, I... Kathy, I found this fascinating, um, and I'm looking forward to reading uh, the work that comes out of this research. I find this research of innovation so interesting. Um, one question that I have is really about the inventions themselves. As, as describing these episodes, I found myself wondering how would someone respond to sort of the standard arguments in favor of patenting? How would someone who uh, was in the medical community during these periods where there, there was a, a patenting look that is sort of vulgar, it sounds, how they might respond to the standard arguments? So um, are we talking, are the episodes that you've looked at um, focusing on inventions that required a, a lot of upfront investment for research and development? Um, years of testing, or were they just sort of inventions that might have uh, come about in the course of trying to improve care for a single patient, say, or, or a certain type of patient? Um, I have more questions, but I'm, I'm biting my tongue, so I'll, I'll, I'll end that first question there. Well, so, well, often, I, th I mean, use, user innovation essentially is innovation that comes from um, users applying, in this case I'm meaning the physicians as users, implying their own experience and knowledge. Um, so it, it is true that quite often, and I think often in the cases of these innovations as well, um, the user innovation is not, does not require a lot of extra investment. Um, but that's actually not always true. Uh, so you do certainly find cases where there is a requirement of a lot of, of extra investment. Um, and so I think it's possible that you could say, well, this is a distinction between things that require a lot of investment and things that, that don't. Um, but I, I, I don't think that that's actually the dividing factor. One thing that's kind of interesting, to, was very interesting to me to find when I was looking through this, um, was that in this ether, during this ether patent, uh, ether anesthesia patent um, controversy, um, there was not a lot of, not outside investment, but a lot of investment by the medical community in figuring out the extent to which ether anesthesia and also um, they were looking at also chloroform at the same time were safe and eff efficacious. Um, so uh, one of the big points that was made against the patenting here was the idea that we don't really know whether this works or not until we put together the information to figure out whether it's safe and efficacious. And so the, at the, there was no clinical trials at that time, but the AMA had a committee that spent several years gathering up people's experiences, um, you know, what side effects people saw, what kinds of things were, were observed, in order to uh, report back to the association and to the group of physicians you know, what, does this really work, and what are, the, what are the, some of the problems that you might expect, and, and so on. And, and so that is a 
relatively large investment, I think, uh, collective investment, actually. Um, but of course you're right that whenever you, if you need a very large investment to do something, it's much harder to get a community to do it because you have to overcome the collective, ac the collective action problems of finding the resources. So yeah, that's, that's certainly true. Um, I also wanted to say that I, I'm not necessarily suggesting with this um, history that this physician opposition to patenting is all necessarily always the right thing or, or the best thing. And in fact, I think that physicians remained opposed to pharmaceutical patents uh, for quite a long time after, maybe after that was an optimal position because they saw it as their, uh, their role to be doing drug innovation. And they were just sort of behind the times in terms of the fact that chemistry was catching up with them and it was really necessary to have chemists to do um, that innovation. Oh, well that's so interesting. Can I, can I follow up with a, a second question or it's a little hard to tell because I can't see what's going on. Yeah, sorry about that, but yes, go for it. <laughs> okay, um, the, it's, so another question that I had was, um, maybe it's along the same lines, were, in terms of uh, disclosure, were many of these inventions disclosed um, in academic journals or in other trade journals? Where, how would um, how would the medical community learn about these these uh, inventions? Yes. Yeah, so, oops, sorry. <laughs> now I'm doing exactly what you suggested, interrupting you. <laughs> what you said about Skype. Um, yes, they were disclosed in um, medical journals in trade publications. Um, and for example, in the, uh, it was kind of amazing to see how quickly the news spread in, back in the ether. Of course, ether anesthesia was a huge, you know, huge invention. Um, how quickly the news spread there. So, um, you know, these, these folks were in qu quite close communication with people, physicians in Europe and so forth. And so um, this spread very quickly through these publications. Um, in the cataract, in the case of the cataract surgery, um, there were both, there were, there were um, official sort of peer-reviewed journals, but the really the um, initial spreading of the information was through these less, uh, less formal trade journals. That's where everybody got the information out first. But there was also conferences, um, videos. The uh, cataract surgeon, the eye surgeons did a lot of videos. Um, and uh, a lot of visiting, a lot of people traipsing back and forth to each other's offices. Also, it was one thing I found interesting about the cataract surgery folks, which may be a little bit special to them, I don't know, um, was that a lot of them were not academics. So a, a lot of the you know, leaders in this, some were, um, but not, definitely not all of the leaders in that area were academics. Some of them were just practitioners who had a lot of patience and got a lot of experience that way. Yeah, uh, that, that's so interesting uh, to hear. It, it reminds me a little bit of um, research that I did on the steel patent pool in the 1800s. Um, similarly involved stories of disclosure taking place outside of the, you know, part of the rhetoric of uh, patent laws. We need uh, the patent system to facilitate disclosure. And the fact that disclosure can take place outside of, there are so many channels by which valuable disclosure can um, take place. It's so interesting. Yeah. So, I mean, it's it's clearly important to be. Uh, there, there definitely is a concern one could have about is there an in, about the in group out group um, issue, and and you could certainly see that with the um, uh, with the Morton Jackson issue, where Morton, although Morton, in some ways he was an outsider, in other ways he wasn't. He was he made himself pretty well known in the um, Boston medical community at the time. But he was a dentist, you know, sort of that was already considered a lesser, you know. Um, so, so there was this insider outsider aspect for sure uh, to worry about there. Um, can I ask a couple or make a couple comments on Mike's thing or? Yeah, how about ask him one question and then we'll open it up to the less qualified people. One question. Uh, okay. Um, well, so, I thought one of the one of the points that you made that to me was most interesting was um, this distinction between pooling data and um, pooling skills, um, because I, I see that there's a big difference there, and this relates to your question your question you had about resources, because it's not only a question of resources that are needed to make the innovation. 
Um, but equally much, and maybe even more so, resources and effort and cost uh, that is needed to actually share the, um, uh, to make, to do the sharing, and sort of how that ki that relates to other goals that people in the community might have. And so I think it's um, sort of a, we are now starting to see this as a, a common theme in various areas where we're worrying about sharing, that when you have to share materials and data, uh, it's much harder than when you're just talking about sharing things like um, procedures and, and, and so forth. So just that that's a common theme, I think, between mm. our two talks. Yeah, this is, I, I could talk about this a little bit. Um, the, so many of the people who I spoke with, um, in particular, people who manage data for hospitals and other healthcare institutions, this was a theme that came back again and again, that uh, the public announcements are always about data, and of course, big data. But hidden in that is the fact that you really do need to, sharing big data is almost meaningless unless you are sharing all of the ancillary information, not even uh, just metadata, but skills that um, the people who collected and organized and were the stewards of the data um, put into its management. So it's easy to, when I, I should say when I began this research project, I was managing, I was imagining it as a much cleaner collective action problem. Okay, we're not collecting patents or copyrights, we're collecting data. But really, it's just that data is the platform on which so much more needs to be shared. Yeah, just to make one little response to that. Um, on a different project that I did, which was a case study of a rare disease research commons, I had, we had in doing our case study exactly that um, same experience. We thought we were going to be talking about sharing knowledge and, and data, and it, it turned out we were talking about much more. Um, so I think that is a general kind of feature of these uh, sharing arrangements that it's really important to look past just kind of the, our free rider, collective action problem, um, patent law pers perspective to ask about what's really going on. Mm. Thank you both so much. I could listen to this all day, <laughs> but I do want to see if we have any audience questions before we break. Could you come to the microphone? Sorry about that. It's tethered. Are these same issues dissimilar or similar within the uh, psychopharmacology relevant to the uh, dichotomy between the psychiatric and the uh, chemist in terms of patents and so forth? But it seems to be a, a, a synergism within the uh, 70s. Um, so I, I can make one response to that, which was one of the, one of the more fascinating um, stories that I know of about um, uh, sharing and, and user innovator community and so on uh, actually comes from a psychiatrist um, named Glenn Sachs who, who is the head of psychiatry of child psychiatry at NYU um, and who uh, this is such a great story um, he went to hear a lecture by Eric von Hippel about user innovation and he thought yeah, you know, this is what we need to do to develop our protocols for treating uh, children who've been through trauma. Um, because one person can create a protocol and our kind of what usually happens is then we protect that protocol and we say you have to do exactly this. But in fact, what to do depends so much on the context and so on. So what we really need to do is develop a collective way of, of, of doing cumulative work and collecting all these things together and not trying to to guard what we've done so much. And uh, so he has become, he do, he's done this, and obviously he's been very successful. Um, and he, uh, in fact, is now has, he had a book out about his, his treatment protocol, but he now has a second book coming out, which is not only about the treatment protocol, but also about how he went about quite intentionally um, trying to organize this sort of uh, collective community um, innovation. Um, so it's really interesting. And I, I was very surprised to get a call from the psychiatry people asking me to come and talk about innovation. I thought that's not where I was going to expect it. But yeah, very. So yes, I think it is relevant there. Hi, my name is Denise Resnick. And so full disclosure, I'm not a lawyer. So I'm, I'm out of my realm here. 
Um, the company I'm with is Nine Sigma. We're an open innovation company, and we host prize-based competitions uh, solely in the technology and scientific genre. So I wanted this idea of resources and IP and data is something that's converging um, amongst most of our clients that are Fortune 500 companies. So you have this environment where you have a Cleveland Clinic, for example, who has patient data, and they want to partner with a GE who is creating this, who's manufacturing the scanning equipment for them. And so in their collaboration, they want to create a patient data set, which now needs to be normalized and sanitized in order to accommodate privacy issues. They want to put that data set out into the open innovation community, so truly in the public space, and have algorithm experts analyze the data looking for patterns and trends, which ultimately could be integrated into the delivery of better decision-making tools in the scanning equipment, which would improve the effic efficacy of the, of the medical community. So there's potential to gain both in terms of improvement but also commercial gain for lots of parties who are involved in that. I can tell you that the corporate lawyers uh, can't even get past the first sentence. I mean, they really are struggling with this idea of who owns the data, who owns the patient <coughs> data, who owns the outcomes, and is it valid to, you know, if you give someone a $100,000 prize for the best algorithm, has that satisfied every, uh, does that create a, um, and is that a risk mitigation sufficient? So I'm curious in terms of, it's a little bit layered in terms of resources and big data, but it's where the community is evolving. Wow, that's, it, that's such an interesting project, and I'd love to speak with you more offline to learn more about it. Um, did I, the sound may have cut out for a moment. Would, did you have a, um, was there, a question that you ended with, or would so, you like so to? So I guess my question is, is there any precedent or is there any research in this area that would provide guidance because the corporate IP uh, lawyers are not experts in innovation. They're not, I mean, they are experts in much more traditional environments. Is there some way that we could guide the dialogue that would be associated with research that you're doing that would help them to see an alternative uh, less structured path. Yeah, so this is a, it's a really complicated problem. Um, at the outset, the more that I've researched big data, and I, I should add, we had a conference here, workshop uh, last month, I'm the, the co-editor of the NMIT Press book, looking at, at the sorts of challenges you're describing with big data, um, strategic management of data uh, within institutions, corporations. Um, Big data does not map neatly onto traditional intellectual property paradigms of patent or copyright. Um, so it is, you know, when you speak, when you think about data, pr protection is very thin from a copyright or patent perspective. Uh, by and large, institutions are looking at their data as trade secrets or maybe just information that's casually being non-disclosed. So that's sort of I think it's helpful to map intellectual property onto the various assets that you're thinking about. That's how IP would map onto big data. Um, trade secrecy is sort of the most meaningful uh, root of, of protection. When you're looking at algorithms, patent protection, may, algorithms that, that extract from the data, uh, patent protection may or may not be helpful. It depends. Uh, there was an, an important case in the last year, CLS, Alice versus CLS Bank, um, that had some interesting things to say about the degree to which uh, methods of manipulating data may or may not be patentable. Copyright could apply to data sets as a whole, uh, but again, that protection is rather thin. So it's difficult. I think um, practitioners who I've talked with, lawyers, are struggling to make sense of how to manage um, how to manage big data and a lot of the struggle is the the fact that lawyers have certain ideas how to protect assets and how to um, commercialize them business people are often ahead of that game they're looking further out into the future and uh, 
there's a lot of catch up being played by the lawyers who I've talked with. Um, this was sort of a foggy response. I'm sorry, but it, it's such a complicated issue. I would love to talk with you more offline about it, though, um, if that would be possible. Sure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you me. both so much. Chris Bucafusco really, really, really wants to ask a question, but we're out of time, unfortunately. <laughs> so maybe he can, maybe you can Skype with Mike. He, he might be able to share his ID. <laughs> All right, my, my maybe Skype another. ID is Michael Mattioli, so please um, <laughs> and just email me or Skype with me. I'd love to talk with everyone there. And I hope I can see all of you in person before too long. I'm, I'm so, so sorry, uh, but also so grateful that I can still be part of this. Thank you so much for Skyping in. <laughs> all right, 15 minute break.
So it's so I've got a combination. So I, I have like. So did you really have to present it again? Well, yeah. well, so I wrote something out. So I wrote something out that's like flexible enough that I can kind of squeeze it or expand it depending on what I hear. But it, and so I don't want to just give the comments book. Yeah. 
that yeah. people that's not so. <clears throat> so it really is kind of how to frame the macro project in a way that links everything up, yeah. but also points out some questions. Yeah. We'll see. I went. I was in New Haven last week and uh, heard a talk uh, by a woman in the philosophy department. who's really awesome there. So she's a philosopher. She really smart and had taken time to do a Mellon Fellowship where she went and got herself trained in cognitive science. Right, so theory of the mind from a philosophical standpoint, theory of the mind from a yeah. physical science standpoint. Um, and so now she's got this project where she's teaching grad students in many, many different disciplines. Yeah. Sort of this integrated view of sort of the technologies of human knowledge. Right? It's just like, oh, I, <laughs> I need to know more about this. Well, so she just was giving a summary of this. This is a year-long program that they run their students No, 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 I was just sort of getting a download of sort of how it's framed and so forth. So, so um, you know, the materials in the course is online. Through the, they, oh, you know, Yale, like all these places, now has access to stuff. So I can go find the syllabus and the readings and so forth. But it's everything, you know, you sort of start with Aristotle and you go all the way through, uh, all the way through Nozick and, uh, you know, contemporary philosophers with a lot of science and technology built in. And so it's for you know historians and philosophers and literature people and psychologists and so forth. Yeah, exactly. It sounds really, really awesome. So um, this stuff is all sort of by definition so multidisciplinary. That it is a, one thing that this because for most of us you have a degree in the field, but um, most of us come at this just sort of as amateurs. Uh, so we're we're sort of but we're thoughtful amateurs, but we're we're borrowing as we go. Mm -hmm. It's not, it's, it's, it's not a way of, 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 of um, I don't, I don't mean to discount the contributions, it's only that um, a little knowledge can be a dangerous thing, right? So, so, <laughs> right, so if you're going to wander into the fields of sociology, it's better to know something about what's really going on, right? Or kind of science or whatever. Yeah, no, no, I, no so we're all, that's actually the gift of being a, a trained lawyer, is that you're trained to wander into new areas and really explore and learn. Right, so that's actually a strength that we bring. So we're not one. We're, this is not a group of people who, when you wander into our 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 world, we say, well, you shouldn't do it that way, uh, which is the way you know subdisciplines of psychology or something is a terrible thing. Right, right, right. So this is balance, uh, but it, Marit, How, what, what did you see her? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Marit's very good. She's um, Israeli, so she's got that really, really amazing work ethic that comes from having trained in the Israeli system. She, um, we, I miss her because at, at our school, I would just say there's a range of, sort of faculty investment in scholarship and thinking, and she was clearly one of the people that, yes. And she does kind of small business entrepreneurship kinds of research. Yeah, I mean, she's, she teaches tax, but she's really trained as a legal historian. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, and, and of course, but she's trained as a legal historian, and she studies the American legal system, but of course she's Israeli, and so she doesn't have the kind of sort of intuitive, it's historical understanding that you would expect coming from this country. So it's a very interesting thing. Charles left um, because his wife got a job at Florida International, and it just, they have young children, and it's just unsustainable for them to be in different cities. Yeah, there's a lot of, yeah, it the, the was a little bit unavoidable. There's just a lot of detail that I can't go into about what was going on with them. But they're together now. That was together, that's probably the most important thing for them. No, well, hiring in clinics, but not a technician. We hired last year, we went, uh, because we had lost Janice in the patent area, so last year I finally persuaded the patent she retired. So the deal with Janice, she never really liked classroom teaching. No, she loves scholarship and writing, and she loves making a lot of money. Uh, so who doesn't? Who right? doesn't? Well, but she. Um, so she, along the way, years ago, she got together with Doc Chisholm, and they had been a couple for a long time. And they actually got married. I didn't really tell anybody, but they got married. And Don, of course, still has his patent consulting practice. It's very robust. And so they basically con had concocted a plan that they just followed the plan. Originally they were going to execute the plan in Mexico, but civil war 
in Oaxaca became a problem. So they, and she's from uh, Kentucky, she's from the Lexington area. So they bought a horse farm outside of Lexington, and that's where they live. And they do consulting in Seattle, and they do consulting in New York, and they write books. And